Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Litchfield. I'm the managing director of NGS Software, although uh, my other title is chief research scientist. And in that capacity, I'm here today talking to you about um, Oracle backdoors, otherwise known as rootkits. Um, the reason I very recently been looking at um, rootkits again is because I'm interest I'm moving more into forensics, uh, database forensics these days. And I'm interested in trying to work out whether there are um, anything, uh, any things that can be done to help um, detect for things like um, backdoors. And eventually you get to the point where you in increase the technology to the point where these things almost become undetectable. And one of the um, examples we'll be looking at today is a, an in-memory backdoor that essentially changes some data um, specifically the, the password hash for the system user, such that anybody can then log on provided they know what you know, the new password is going to be. So it's essentially um, because you're not hooking any kind of um, function or changing any code in, in memory, and you're, you're changing data that is there to be changed, it's, it's going to be very difficult to protect against, basically. So database backdoors or rootkits are really nothing new. Um, in 2001, um, NGS Software, the company I worked for, warned of a, a potential backdoor in SQL Server that basically you change the X status of uh, one of the user accounts and you could still log on. So it essentially looked like a, um, you know, th this um, was a, a group user, um, sorry, a, a group, but essentially it turned out to be a user who could log on with, um, uh, you know, full privileges and so on. Um, Chris Anley then uh, moved uh, further on into um, you know, database backdoors. Um, he wrote a paper called Violating Database Enforced Security Mechanisms. Uh, and essentially it covers runtime patching. It, it essentially um, hooks the, uh, a couple, well, there's a, a function called um, uh, f has uh, object permissions that basically looks up a, um, the, the UID of the, the user. And if that user ID returned is one, then no code, you know, no uh, permissions checking is done. So the actual compare is is patched essentially, so it always returns uh, the effective user ID as, as one, so that um, you know um, permissions checking is essentially disabled. And then uh, in 2002, uh, a couple of days later in 2002, actually. Um, as part of the paper that um, I presented at Black Hat, uh, that eventually, you know, had had the code in it to exploit the um, the uh, SQL Server name resolution service that eventually was exploited by uh, the Slammer worm. In there, I also spoke about um, Trojan extended store procedures and start procedures and everything like that. Then database hackers handbook that uh, myself and a couple of other colleagues wrote at um, NGS Software. Uh, we warned about the dangers of uh, trusting views when uh, doing audits of, of database servers simply because views can't be trusted. Uh, most recently, Alexander Kornbrust has been speaking about hiding users and processes. And um, then last year at uh, Black Hat in Oracle Rootkits 2, he uh, brought up an interesting, uh, well, of, of his talk, the most interesting topic there, I believe, was pin procedures. What pin procedures basically means is essentially you can lock um, in the, uh, the Oracle SGA, the, the code of um, uh, some PL SQL packages, basically. So you can manipulate, you know, modify the, the package, uh, lock it in the SGA, and then change the code back again. So that if anyone comes along and does an audit, like of the um, of, of the procedure, like for example, you know, compares the checksums, then the original checksum is there, but the one in memory is actually um, the one that takes precedence. So that was uh, an interesting attack. Um, the, the problem is um, current rootkits are trivial to spot. So this is I'm asking the question here. You know, if, if we've got all this stuff on, on database rootkits, what's the you know what's the point in having a talk today, nearly five years after the, the topic was originally broached? Um, why why continue talking about database rootkits? Well, uh, current rootkits are trivial to spot. Um, we've solved that problem. We can you know find these things really easily. Um, what about the next generation of rootkits? And indeed. Um, in uh, Alexander's talk last year, he alludes to third generation toolkits that basically, um, you know, modify data and, and so on to allow access. Now, uh, Alex's talk didn't really present any um, third generation rootkits, 
So today, that's what I'm here going to uh, I'm going to present today. Basically, is, is present a couple of third generation rootkits uh, that demonstrate what can be done. So before getting to that, let's look at um, some of the current backdoors or rootkits. I mean, some people might break into a database server and create themselves an account, which they can then come back to and log into later on. Now, obviously, anybody doing an audit of the server will come along and select from, say, for example, DBA users and see this account called hacker or, or whatever it happens to be. The point is a, a DBA who is on the ball will recognize that there are accounts on a system that really shouldn't be there. So the next step to that is basically you know, hiding um, modifying the view such as DBA users and, and all users so that when you know someone comes along and, and does a select username from DBA users the the account name is, is essentially hidden other methods of uh, backdooring uh, you know Oracle oh, well actually before we talk any further this isn't just um, applicable to Oracle by the way this is uh, across the board as far as all database servers are concerned or in terms of the ramifications but in terms of the specifics obviously we're, we're dealing with Oracle here so modify some PL SQL packages, um, trivial to do, especially if you are, have an unwrapper. Uh, there are a couple of unwrappers floating out there, but essentially um, you unwrap the code, make your modifications, and uh, rewrap the code and, and upload it again. Now obviously, trivial to spot again because the checksum um, of the, the, the PL SQL package has changed itself. Um, other ones are there are some dangerous PL SQL packages that, for example, um, take a, um, uh, a string and executes that string as straight SQL. Now, a lot of the um, sysown packages uh, will do that. I, I list a number of them in the Oracle Hackers Handbook. Um, the the idea is basically if you know you lose access for you know um, for whatever reason, then. Uh, or, or you lose your DBA privs if you, you've given yourself DBA privs. You can go around giving yourself these privs again uh, by you know, um, executing one of these PL SQL packages. Um, modify or create uh, after logon triggers. So every time someone logs in, you can check whether the user has the re requisite permissions. If they do, you can go and do, you know, execute some nefarious code. And again, uh, the same with start procedures. Or indeed, um, going all the way to modifying binaries. Now, we'll look at a couple of examples of these um, and why they're, in terms of implementation, so, well, not poor, but easy to spot and uh, how they go about themselves. So, um, modifying views, you know, so um, along comes a user, creates himself a, an account called Hacker, uh, and he wants to hide the fact, so um, they'll modify the view of DBA users and, and all users so that the Hacker account isn't displayed. Um, because it's modifying a, an object in the data dictionary, th this is trivial to spot. Um, the, the, one of the aspects of this is checksumming the code of the view and then comparing that later on is not the right way around uh, you know, to check for, for modifications. Because at the end of the day, you're trusting a database server which may have been compromised. So it's, you know, if, uh, if the attacker's you know, that advanced, basically, they can modify the, um, the database server such that when someone does a, a check on, on the, the code of the view, um, for example, they might use the DBMS uh, utility package uh, to create the checksum, then they just need to modify that and you know, fire back what, whatever they want you to see, essentially. So essentially, you need to go to the data file, or ex data file itself, extract the view body from that, and do your checksumming on, on, on that directly. Um, Another way of you know, um, not worrying about the, the views problem is essentially just use the underlying table itself. Um, you know, rather than relying on DBA users, just use the sys.user table and so on. Now, a, a very nice, simple way of checking whether... <coughs> of checking whether you know, someone's actually manipulated the... Um, the DBA user's view, for example, is, is using the minus operator. So I'm just going to change the view uh, for a second here so that an account called Hagsaw is uh, not shown. If we see there in the bottom right-hand corner, essentially we're modifying the view there so that if the, the user Hagsaw is displayed, uh, is there, don't show it, essentially. So if I actually go ahead and create that user first, um, connect slash assist DBA. Create user um, XOR identified by password. 
Now grant create session to XOR. Okay, so if we do a select uh, username from DBA users, uh, username equals Hacksaw. We can see the, the user exists. So we modify the view essentially so that now obviously this requires um, the requisite permissions, but we can do this through, for example, uh, PL SQL injection vulnerability. There's there's a number of them. Um, so the next time we run that query. you know, no user exists. So the thing is, if we compare those two, we, if we select from users, where type is uh, one, in other words, a user, and we select from username where, um, if from DBA users, if there's any rows returned, then that says there's a difference between the underlying view and the, sorry, the underlying table and, and the overlying view. So that indicates that there is indeed a, a problem with, with DBA users, so that's been changed. So that's just using the minus operator. We, of course, uh, in, in, you know, when we're doing an audit, rather than using DBA uh, users and having to worry about that, just use the underlying table, essentially. So if I just change that all back again. Okay, so if we then go back and redo this, there should be no difference between the two. So no error selected, so that's good. So uh, our, our um, hacker, sorry, our um, hacker account should exist again. So select username from DBA users order by one. So there we go. So it's, it's visible again. That's good. Okay. Okay. So you get the idea. These, these are trivial to spot. You know, we, we just check some of the code of, of the view um, or just use the underlying table, essentially. Um, so rather than actually modifying the view itself, um, Another way of achieving the same thing, actually, is exploit the view contents instead. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if we look at the text of the view, there's a whole bunch of predicates down here. Oop, excuse me. These are the predicates here, essentially the, the, the where clause. So um, if we get rid of that. Um, now, all we need to do is essentially pick one of these things and make it not true. Um, and ensure that we can still log in with that account. So for example, if we look at um, this row here, where u.datatsnumber number is the same as dts.ts number, that's essentially looking at the, um, the default table space and everything like that. Well, if we choose a table space that doesn't exist, um, this DTS, by the way, is anyone, uh, do we have a laser pointer, by the way? No? Okay, it's not worries. I'll just highlight it here. Um, this DTS here is essentially taken from There. So if we, if we modify the user directly, so he has a um, a data dot, uh, a data TS. Oh, great! Thanks very much. Remind me uh, to give it to you <laughs> back at the end of time. Um, how does this work? Uh -huh. So um, essentially, in here, if we choose a um, a table space number that doesn't actually exist, and we'll do this. Um, so here we're going to set the um, the uh, data TS um, in the user table to uh, 1337. One row updated, commit that. If we select um, username from uh, DBA users where Username equals Hacksaw. Uh, no rows are selected, essentially. Um, and that's because here, when that view is, is uh, essentially called, 
uh, this, is, this is no longer true. So uh, the username Hagsaur isn't returned. So just verifying that. Uh, order i1. Because in this case, um, obviously, there is no uh, table space name with a number of um, of 1337. So if we then go back and modify that to say 4, which is a table space number that does exist, commit that, and then rerun the same query, we can see it, it's, it's back again. Okay? So rather than um, modifying the, the text of the view, I mean, we can simply just manipulate the view itself so that it's disappeared. Now, I say it's, this is a new method. It's not really new. This is exactly the same thing in, in Oracle that we did with xstatus in SQL Server. It's essentially abusing the view's content itself to, um, to make it, you know, um, the account hidden. And of course, we can still use the underlying table user dollar to, to find user accounts. So it doesn't solve any problems as such. It's just rather than changing the view of the text kind of thing, which is going to be easily noticeable, just modify the um, do a direct uh, manipulation of the, the, the data t t TS number, for example. OK, modifying the binaries. Um, from Alex's Oracle Rootkits 2.0, Add the account, make a copy of the user table, um, and call it uh, a s e r a dollar. Drop the account, stop the server, look for all occurrences of um, user dollar, and change it for a uh, you know a a zero dollar. Restart the server. Now uh, the, all logins are now consequently read from from this table. And so um, when the uh, DBA looks at user dollar, you know, um, so he, he thinks, okay, I can't trust the view, so I'll look at user dollar instead. Uh, the account is not visible. Well, there's a lot of hoops to jump through there, obviously. Um, but one of the obvious reasons this will be uh, easily spotable is the next time the DBA adds a new user account and, you know, does a regular check on uh, user dollar, he'll be like, well, wait a minute, I just added an account. Where is that account? It's not showing in the, in the user table. Um, so uh, it, it, it sticks out like a sore thumb, um, as does um, the, the presence of a new data dictionary object, as does shutting down and restarting the database server. If, um, if your DBAs don't notice that, you should fire them and, and get new DBAs kind of thing. And of course, we can check some of the, the OS files themselves. Um, Again, uh, improving the method, why, uh, essentially the object here is to have a user account that's not visible from the user dollar table. So can we do anything to you know, uh, achieve the same ends without actually having to modify the binary? Well, of course we can, otherwise I wouldn't be speaking about it. So if we, for example, um, do a create user XOR2 identified by password, uh, grant create session to Hagsaw2. Uh, if we then connect as Hagsaw2, and then reconnect as sys, connect uh, sysdba, if we then delete um, from user dollar where name equals hagsor oops hagsor2 mm, zero okay one row deleted commit that okay now if we try and log, because we've essentially deleted that user, we've not dropped it, we've deleted the user, um, it, you know, can we still log in with it? And of course, slash password. So we've deleted that user, but we can still log in with it, essentially. So the thing is, if we then reconnect, or let's, if we go uh, select uh, username from all users, order by one, we can see that our Hagsaw account is in there, obviously, but our Hagsaw2 account isn't there. That's because we've deleted it from the, you know, um, the, uh, the, the, the sys um, 
sys.user dollar table. So essentially, this achieves the same ends um, as modifying the, um, the binary. We, we hide the account from user dollar, um, but essentially, um, this account is in the SGA. It, it's still in the SGA and, and available to, to be logged on because we've just done a direct delete from the user uh, dollar table. So whilst it's more practical, because you obviously don't need to shut the server down and everything like that, the, the point is um, this will not survive a, a server restart. So the user, uh, the attacker needs to reinfect the server if it's ever stopped. But given that it's a database server and database servers are very rarely stopped, the, the user, or the attacker rather, has a good chance of, of their access being there for a long, long time. The way I see it, if you can modify a binary though, why not just patch the code so that um, if there's a user called, uh, if someone attempts to log in with a uh, username of hacks, or whether it exists or not, just log them in anyway, kind of thing. That, to me, is the easier way of doing it, because that way you don't have to create, you know, arbitrary objects in the in the data dictionary. <coughs> so, third generation rootkits. In memory backdoors, basically, these are the things that Alex uh, Alexander, you know, alluded to in his talk last year. So what are our options? Runtime patching of code. Well, you know, Chris Anley did that kind of thing in, in 2002. Um, so we won't repeat his efforts here. But we uh, will obviously talk about, uh, you know, um, at the end of that, looking at ways of, you know, catching attempts to patch uh, code at runtime. Obviously, we could change uh, entries in the import address table. Um, when a, um, a, a, an executable loads, or a DLL for that matter, and it requires to import um, functions from other DLLs, uh, then the addresses are stored in what's known as the import address table. Now, uh, and these are then dereferenced when they're, when they're called. So obviously, if we can manipulate these, we can redirect the flow of execution. The other one, which is what we're mainly going to be concentrating on, is the manipulation of data. Um, data that is supposed to change, so um, in terms of watching for attacks against it, it's going to be much more difficult. Then we have to look at delivery mechanisms. Um, how do we get our in-memory backdoor loaded? Um, we'll look at external processes, network li or libraries over the network, DLLs over the network, or for example, which is probably going to be the most easiest and most common attack is either a buffer, buffer overflow, whether it be stack-based or heap-based, uh, format string bug, or the kind of write uh, a D word of your choosing to anywhere of your choosing kind of uh, premise. So if we look at uh, external processes as a delivery mechanism, we could use external procedures, for example. Um, call the system function to load a, an executable over the network. Uh, that executable would call open process on the Oracle process. Um, virtual alloc x, this is obviously on Windows, by the way, if you're wondering. <laughs> uh, call virtual alloc x to allocate memory in the, the, you know, the Oracle process. We need space for the stack and the code itself. We then write um, into the, um, the Oracle process using write process memory, um, and then create remote thread. But basically what we do is point the, the thread to the beginning of the code section. And then off it goes, and you can do whatever you want to do. You can do the same things, obviously. We can run executables from the Oracle JVM. Um, but if we're running, the Oracle JVM is built into the Oracle process, by the way. So we'll look at, you know, that's a bit redundant in a way, um, because, uh, well, well, we'll come to that in a minute. We could call uh, DBMS scheduler, or we can modify the, um, the PLS SQL compiler flags. Um, and the, the make utility, we can set that to an executable um, and, again, do the same things. Or we could load a DLL um, from the um, Oracle JVM, again, which, as, as I said, is internal. So this is why, I, you know, it's like, why do you need to load an executable just to achieve the same thing? Because we're already in the process anyway. We would call system load, system.load, and... Um, you know, it allows us to do whatever we want, obviously, once that DLL is loaded. So as a quick demonstration of this, um, this is just a simple uh, DLL that exports, you know, some functionality. It's a memory manipulator, basically, um, and a shell server. So once we are um, you know, have our requisite uh, DBA privileges, basically, we can then...
essentially go around setting out, creating a, um, a uh, Java class that will load a library for us. We then wrap a procedure around that and execute that. So this will load over the network. I'm hoping it will anyway. Might take a moment. Well, not might, it is taking a moment. Whilst that's going on in the background. I can't really talk about the next thing because until this is demo's over. Come on. address. Oh, right, back in business. Okay, so PL SQL procedures uh, successfully completed. If we then look at um, the DLLs list, DLLs, um, oracle.exe, we can see that um, it's loaded into the, um, the Oracle address space, the uh, shell server listener.dll. Now, that there is its um, base address. So we can uh, manipulate this uh, contents of memory. So if we go uh, star uh, dump the next um, 10, oops, I need a host name, Apollo. So this basically you know, takes an address and dumps memory from that. So we can in inspect memory. Um, this here is the, um, the beginning of the, you know, the, uh, the, the DLL we've just loaded, essentially. And this here is uh, M, Z, uh, and so on. You know, the, 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 um, the PE header, basically. So we can then change that if we wanted to. Not that this buys us anything, but we could change this to 41, 41, 41. So if we then re-look at that, we can see that we've written memory uh, in the Oracle process, essentially, to 41, 41. Now, what we could do is, is use this to cycle through memory, looking for interesting things, um, and, and change that uh, to, to suitable values. Um, or, to show you what else the shell server does, it's really crappy, but a lot of fun. Uh, on port 1337 um, is a shell server, essentially. Um, so, you know, we can run commands and stuff like that. So that's all um, this uh, DLL or backdoor does. It allows me to poke memory and um, connects me to a shell um, if, if I want it. Really crappy, but does the job. Okay. Buffer overflows. Okay, these are probably going to be the simplest attack because obviously if, if, there's, um, if the, the remote Oracle server can get back out uh, to me over you know, the network, then there's real problems with egress filtering on the firewall. They shouldn't be able to do that. So in terms of delivery, um, if we can exploit um, a buffer overflow, um, we can pretty much load up everything we want uh, from there. So the example we're going to show here is exploit a buffer overflow, an excellent buffer overflow in Oracle. Um, it looks for the, the password hash for the system user, and it does this by calling an Oracle function um, that essentially hands me back some user structures um, in, the, um, in the SGA, and once it's found the, the password hash for the system user, it changes it to a known hash um, that essentially is a password for secret. So the way it works is basically we, we need a handle to the SGA stuff first. Now these are hard-coded for this version of Oracle, um, but obviously um, you know, to make it um, useful across all versions of Oracle, then um, you, you need to uh, avoid the hard-coded address problem. But essentially, we, um, at this stage here, we've essentially got the, the handle to the, the beginning of the user structures, essentially. 
Uh, once we've got that, we see we can we, we push EAX there. Eventually, going back, uh, we left it with EAX and, and appointed to that there. We push that onto the stack, and then um, load some other stuff up. Um, here, we have um, the the user we're interested in is is five um, for the system user. So we load into um, EAX the effective address of um, the base partner <laughs> plus OX one uh, C. And then we write five two to that value, push EAX, push seven, move into EAX the value of sorry the address of the function we want to call. That's actually in the um, Oracle executable itself, and then we call it. Now um, I got this address by um, disassembling the um, the authentication procedures essentially, and looked at what it did and thought, well, actually, wait a minute, we can hook into that, and basically you know, manipulate the, the password hashes. So once we call EAX, essentially, we should have a pointer back to the uh, user structure for the system user. We then um, make some modifications to that. So um, OXC2 bytes into the, the structure, um, we, we get the, uh, the beginning of the password hash. So this here is the password hash. And we're gonna, that's the password hash for the system user when it has a password of secret like that. So we then write that into, we overwrite the, the extant password hash essentially there. Um, the vector I'm using here happens to require that the exploit be written in ASCII, so this needs a bit of explanation. The exploit I'm going to be demoing, um, because it has to be ASCII, I've written a, um, an ASCII, where's this? Um, a decoder, I've written the decoder writer in ASCII. Um, so the exploit when it begins has the decoder writer, a buffer, a destination for the decoder when it, when it gets written out, and the encoded exploit. So when the decoder writer executes down this way, it starts writing um, the decoder out this way. So eventually, the two join. And when the two join, execution continues from down here onwards. Whoops. And obviously the decoder, all that does basically, it loops decoding this stuff here. And eventually the decoder finishes and we continue execution from there onwards kind of thing. So that way we can get our arbitrary code across without having to worry about, um, you know, there being like characters greater than um, 7F, OX7F kind of thing. Okay, the decoder, uh, the, the decoder itself, essentially when I encode the exploit, I take a byte of exploit, split it into two, the most significant four bytes and the least significant four, not bytes, the most significant four bits and least significant four bits, add 41 to each half essentially, OX41 to each half, and then um, that becomes our encoded exploit. So decoding that exploit is the same in reverse. Essentially, we set um, ESI and EDI to point to the beginning of the um, the encoded exploit, um, move the byte in to uh, the AR register, uh, subtract 41 from it, shift, uh, shift it left um, four bits, and then increment the, uh, the pointer to the next byte in, in, in the list, add that to um, the AR register, subtract 41, and eventually we're left with our original um, byte of real exploit code, um, our actual exploit code in AL, which is then written to uh, ESI. We increment the pointers and keep on going and uh, until we come across um, this um, uh, either a Q or, or more. So it's, um, that uh, uh, essentially is our equivalent of our null terminator, but it's not a null terminator. It's if, if, if it's Q or more, you know, stop looping. So otherwise, go back and loop up to there. So because these slides will be available offline, before uh, doing the demo, um, I've, I've obviously got some screenshots, which I'm, I'm obviously going to do this live, but for those people who you know, aren't going to be here, there should have been another slide in there. I must have deleted it. Um, we can see here, we'll be logging on as manager. That works. Uh, connecting is secret. Fails. You know, I'm get connected to Oracle. Now, I've uh, redacted the, the actual vulnerable function itself. Um, for those people who will be reading it later because, um, you know, it's, it's 
better to go that way because it's, I don't want to be handing out real live exploits. Um, and afterwards we can, we try and log on with our old password, it doesn't work anymore, but we log on as secret. So demonstrating this, now you guys are obviously going to get to see it because I can hardly redact it in front of you. Uh, but if we connect Scott slash Tiger, um, if I show you here, if I connect system slash manager, we're connected. If I obviously try to connect with secret invalid username or password, so if I now This is, the, this is the actual code. Let me walk you through this. So essentially what we're doing here is um, filling up the buffer here. X is, is, is our buffer, essentially. Uh, we overwrite the save return address. Well, actually, we're overwriting the exception handler here, to be honest. I should, I should fix that. And we're overwriting it with... Uh, this value, this value exists in oracore.dll. There is a pop pop ret at this address. Uh, this here is obviously the, the ASCII equivalent of it there. Um, some more bytes. Oh, we have to have a short jump up here. Basically, this jumps us over the um, address, basically, uh, when we're in memory. We need to adjust ESP correctly for this to work. And this here is our ASCII armored shellcode decoder. Uh, this here is the buffer where it all gets written to. So that's where our decoded, sorry, that's where our decoder is written to. And this here is the encoded backdoor. Um, funnily enough, um, it starts with jail. It's like, uh, don't use this, otherwise you will go to jail. That's just completely coincidental. Um, and here is the termination. Uh, this could be Q, for example, or, or more. And then we execute the function. Now, because this actually itself um, calls terminate thread on, on, the, on the thread itself to continue um, from, you know, to continue execution, uh, it's going to hang in this window. So it's hanging now, but this should have changed the password hash to secret. So if I go one up there and hit enter, I'm now connected. So all that's done is, is basically, as I said, um, called an Oracle function that's returned a handle to the, the user structure um, for the system user. We've overwritten his password hash in, in the SGA uh, with the known hash for, um, for that which would equate to, uh, equate to secret and gain access. So the, the idea there is obviously in terms of detection, Runtime patching we can detect quite easily because we can hook calls to, for example, say virtual protect X or virtual protect. So if anyone tries to do any runtime patching of, of code, because code is loaded as read only, if we if we if we don't have code which is uh, write, uh, code pages which are writable, then we're going to have to call this. And by default, they're not writable. So um, if we hook this and make sure the call is coming from known safe locations and so on then uh, if uh, someone exploits a buffer overflow to call virtual protect X or virtual protect, then we can, we can monitor um, accesses for that and so on. And again, I uh, changes to the uh, import address table. Um, they're quite easy to spot too. Uh, it's easy relative to, to the, the problem of changing data. Changes to data that are supposed to be changed, for example, the password hash of the system user, um, well, sure, we can go ahead and, and protect that area of memory, watch it for changes and everything like that, and, and alert if there are any changes and say we, we may have been compromised. Well, what about the next thing? You know, we can't go around protecting every bit of data that has um, some relevance to the security of, of the server, because eventually we'll be using up so much processing time that there'll be no processing time left to service database queries. So this is a real problem. Um, how do we protect against this? Well. If someone can come up with a solution, a, a light solution for that, then you know that would be wonderful, and you could probably make millions of pounds from it, or, or euros rather. Um, currently, I think the best thing you can do is keep your, your servers locked down and and watch for abnormal activity. So, any questions?
Ne? Čo? Čo? Well, there's nothing, you, there's nothing wrong with this. I mean, at the end of the day, once you, you're running, once you're running um, code through a buffer overflow, for example, then you're running code at the end of the day. It's not like you can do anything to protect against these things. Or if you are, if you do own the, the server uh, with sys privileges, you know, it's like, well, you can do anything you want anyway. So it's not really an Oracle problem, to be, to be honest. Um, once you've got the keys to the kingdom, you've got the keys to the kingdom, you know? So um, in terms of protecting against things like new flaws as and when they come up, well, they're, they're you know, taking steps to remediate um, you know, new buffer overflows or SQL injection flaws all the time. So. But it's not, Oracle's done nothing wrong here, by the way, nor, nor if this was applicable to, to SQL Server or Postgres or MySQL. No, no database vendor is, is at, you know, at fault here. It's just simply, once you own it, here's stuff you can do to retain you know, access at a later date kind of thing. So. No other questions? Sure. Yeah, well, we could re repeat the exercise and change it back to, um, you know, the old password hash, essentially. And then you have two processes hanging there? Or? Well, no, it's not, it's no, it's no longer hanging. This is, this is on, this SQL Plus is hanging on my machine, the attacker's machine kind of thing. And as far as the remote server's concerned, the thread's just terminated kind of thing. So as far as it's concerned, you, the client's disconnected kind of thing, and that, that thread's torn down. So, um... Yeah, it's just SQL Plus doesn't recognize that the thread's terminated on the remote server. It thinks it's still there kind of thing. And it's waiting for a response coming back. Since you change the memory, if it's rebooted, the old patch reverts. Correct. So you're speaking, you, um, could, you, could you repeat the question so it's in the audio? Well, um, the, the, the thing was, if, well, have you got the, the mic there? I was just saying that since it's only changed in memory, if the system's rebooted, it reverts, and then if you're clever, you just change the password, log in, and change it right back. Absolutely. And yeah. the only way you're saying you'd notice any of that is if you're hooked to uh, one system call that you're using. Uh, well, um, sure, we, we could hook this, this, this function and everything like that and make sure it's coming from a, a, you know, a verifiable source, for example. But at the end of the day, we can, the, the, you know, we can modify something else that has you know, um, security relevance. For example, we could change the fact that it's you know, the, the bits that say whether you're a, um, a DBA or not. For example, we flip you know, a 0 to a 1 or a 1 to a 0, which, whichever happens to be. So we protect against that, and we protect against this, and eventually we've got this whole long list of things we protect against. And as I said, you, you can't really do that with a database server because for every thousand things you think of protecting, there's going to be another 3,000 which you know, you're not protecting. And um, you know, we can still use, it has the same equivalence kind of thing of, of achieving the same thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, once this server's stopped, and uh, we would need to reinfect it again, obviously. So um, it, it obviously would have to depend on the, the target environment, whether they apply patches or not. If they don't apply patches, then your you know, initial vector, re reinfection vector, is still going to be that kind of thing. So. No other questions? Great. Well, in that case, thank you very much.